Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do amazing energy work, healing work out into the world, all over the world. So if you would like to look at their books, at their programs, or become a facilitator, go to Dr. Dane here, H E E R dot com and accessconsciousness.com. The Dare to Dream podcast has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards as well as a Webby Award, and it's ranked in the top best podcasts in all of USA and self improvement on Apple Podcasts, and also ranks in the top podcasts in other countries as well. Last week, we broke very high in Italy, which made me thrilled, especially because we're going to be talking about past lives today with our guest, and I'm pretty sure I've had at least a few in Italy. So thanks, Italy, for checking in with us. I am a certified coach whose expertise is visibility in media. I coach people to write a page-turner book, take their book to a guaranteed international bestseller, and I pull back the curtain so clients have the system to be interviewed on media and podcasts and get massive results. I show people how to find and use media exposure to locate their tribe, fill workshops, sell books, and gain exposure. You can connect with me at debbie-dashinger.com, D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com, and you can click there as soon as you get on the site, and you can receive my gift to you. What's your message out to the world? It's a template to fill in, and you'll also get some free tools and templates so that you can increase your visibility out into the world right away. Question, would you like to unleash the wisdom and power of a thousand lifetimes through past life therapy to discover your soul's design and purpose? My guest today is Joanne DiMaggio. She's a respected expert in the field of reincarnation and soul writing, which she describes as a written form of meditation. Joanne has been actively involved with Edgar Cayce's Association for Research and Enlightenment since 1987, and she's been the coordinator for the ARE in Charlottesville, Virginia team since August 2008. She earned her master's in transpersonal studies degree and her spiritual mentor certificate through Atlantic University. She's a much sought after lecturer. She's given talks about past life exploration, life between lives and soul writing. Joanne has been professionally pursuing past life research and therapy for over 30 years. She's a graduate of the Eastern Institute of Hypnotherapy with additional training in hypnosis and also studied under Dr. Irene Hickman, who's a pioneer in the field of non-directive hypnotherapy. She's written many, many books and you can look online for them. And she is even working on a book yet to come. And today we'll be talking about her latest book called I did it to myself again. New Life Between Lives case studies show how your soul's contract is guiding your life. If you would like to learn more about her books and her services and who she is, go to joannedimaggio.com. And Joanne, it is so great to have you on Dare to Dream. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Debbie. I'm really glad to be here today. Yeah, so I'm going to show people your book just to get started here. And um, I'm excited to deep dive into this and in fact, into the entire subject of what you offer. So I want to start here because when it comes to past lives and reincarnation and reading everything that's in your book, it becomes very clear there are no mistakes, right? (laughs) There's great purpose why we're here, why we're in this body, why we chose our parents, all of that. And so that said, would you speak to what is happening in a global sense right now in the world that you and I are here right now, living today, 
during the COVID pandemic, during the uproar in politics, during a lot of shifts and changes. Is there a reason that we agreed on a soul level now? Well, yeah, I think that everyone should realize that nothing is random. There's nothing random in the universe at all. It's all well planned out. And uh, uh, a lot of people are asking that question. Why am I here now of all time? Why do I have to go through this? I don't want to go through this. Um, and it's all designed to be a part of your soul's plan. So um, I think that experiences that we're having in this time are enabling our souls to grow to work on karmic issues uh, from the past. We're applying some karma uh, and our karmic attributes in order to work through a lot of the things that are happening. It's really about the present. Past life work is about the present. So it's how are you handling this? Are you becoming a, maybe you're becoming a role model to somebody. So it isn't, it isn't necessarily uh, what you're doing, um, you know, volunteering somewhere, doing something like that. It's you know, even to your own family, how are you responding to this? You know, what, what are the words you're using? What are the thoughts you're using? What are your actions? How are you, how are you, um, you know, handling simple things like wearing a mask or keeping social distancing and, and, you know, family gatherings and stuff like that. But I think also it's given many, many of us an opportunity to stop in our tracks and to revisit um, why we're here, what's, what's our purpose, uh, start to reprioritize things in, in our life that maybe we neglected from before. So it's, it's giving us many, many positive uh, uh, opportunities for growth that we would not normally have had had we not been faced with this. So spending this concerted amount of time at home has opened a lot of doors. Like I was mentioning to you earlier, for me, it's all about understanding technology and gee, how does Zoom work and all those things that I normally wouldn't have thought of. But all these things are helping me to reach more people and, and in effect to offer some healing services. Um, it's all about that question of why. And, and a lot of past life work is, is surrounds that question. Why, why is this happening? Why am I here? Why did I pick these parents? Why do I have these problems in relationships? Why do I have financial problems? All those questions that we ask um, can be answered through this work. And then taking it a step further, going into the life between lives, you know, that whole project um, came about um, because a lot of people are afraid of death. And so this, I thought, if you get a bunch of strangers together, which is what I did, and you ask them, what is it like in the afterlife? What happens when you die? And you go into the afterlife. If their answers are basically the same, which they were, by the way, then you can safely say to yourself, well, that must be the way it is. That doesn't sound so bad, you know, and, and that fear uh, becomes less and less and less. And, uh, and especially now with, with so many of our, our uh, fellow brothers and sisters passing over at this time, you know, having that fear that, you know, well, you know, if it's in your own family or you're afraid for yourself, understanding what the life process is, the, the continuation of life is, and understanding what happens once you are on the other side. I think that's the value of this work. For those who uh, have not yet read your book, Mm -hmm. but are curious when you say to a person, when you ask the question, what happens after you die, that mm -hmm. you receive consistent feedback on that. What was the feedback that you received? What was the pattern you heard over and over and over again? Surprisingly, they all said basically the same thing. They had no fear of death at all. They were fully conscious, so which meant that they knew that they were dying. They had a total sense of freedom and release um, from this life. They were relieved and they said it was a very gentle process. Um, there were a few that said that felt like they were, um, that their soul was either squeezed out of the body or yanked out of the body. But most of them said that, that it was very peaceful and uh, 
a great majority said they could move around freely afterwards. Uh, they did not necessarily hover over the body. That happens a lot in, in near-death experiences, but I didn't find that happening that much in the, the life between life. I think it's because they knew that that life was definitely ending. They weren't going to pop back into that body. Uh, so most of them left uh, immediately. Those that had a traumatic death, which I thought was real interesting. And by traumatic, I mean, you know, a very, what you would call a painful death. Um, uh, you know, they might have been tortured or something horrendous. They burned at the stake or something like that. Those souls, those people said that their soul left their body before the physical body, the, the body physically died. So they popped out before the body actually was gone. Uh, so they did not have to endure uh, that, the pain of, of that, uh, that death. And I always think of Joan of Arc because I've heard that story over and over again where, where I've heard that um, her soul left her body long before her body died. So, um, so that was comforting to know that uh, even in the worst of circumstances, we have the ability to pop out uh, at will and, uh, and, and, and just let that go, let the physical part of us go. Yeah, that's very interesting. And it is comforting, I agree, because um, some of those stories are pretty horrific to hear and imagine. Mm -hmm. And I know that you're very well respected as an expert in reincarnation as well as in soul writing. So I am familiar with reincarnation because, you know, I've done sure. it over and over again. Sure. So I'm familiar with it. It's a little joke there. But as far as soul writing goes, that is a new term for me. So can you describe what is soul writing? How do we do soul writing? What is the reason for doing it? Sure. Well, the reason I, I um, got involved with soul writing was uh, it ended up being the thesis for my master's degree. And my first book, Soul Writing, Accessing Your, your, uh, yeah, accessing your Inner Voice, uh, had to do with soul writing, um, had to do with the process of it, which I learned from Edgar Cayce. I'm a, a student of Edgar Cayce. Soul writing is a written form of meditation. It is uh, writing in an altered state of consciousness. So it's you going into a meditative state, however you do it when you do your normal meditations. Uh, surround yourself with white light, say a prayer of protection, and then put the pen in your hand and just allow it to freely uh, write. Uh, let the words reveal themselves. Now, this is not automatic writing. There is a difference between the two. Automatic writing, um, and I list in my book and um, also on my web, not on my website, but in my book, uh, the difference between the two so that people understand that it's not the same as uh, automatic writing, which the ARE listed automatic writing, I think is the number one or two no-no huh. if you want to develop your psychic abilities. I think the Ouija board was right up there with it. And that's because with automatic writing and you're not, you're skipping some steps. You're not doing the, the, um, uh, the white light protection, the prayer, uh, and um, it can let some lower level influences kind of get in and take over your hands. So they're a little worried about possession. And I can attest to that. If you take shortcuts sometimes, and I, I, was, I was doing that in the beginning of my, of my ex exploring all of this. Um, and I knew that something else was working in my hand. I could feel the difference. You could feel wow. it. But, but the, the thing about the soul writing, which is so beautiful, I changed the name. I, I, it's, um, Edgar Casey called it inspirational writing. Mm. But if you look up inspirational writing now, it's all Christian genre books. Uh. If you look up automatic writing, it's all occult. So I thought neither one of those was the right definition. This is information coming from above, coming through you into your soul and out again. Mm. I think of it as a 24-7 phone home card. You can ask any question of spirit that you want, any time that you want, and you'll always get an answer. So for a lot of people, you know, they, they've talked to their friends about their problems, they've talked to their ministers or priests about their problems, they've gone to therapists, they've talked to family members, and they're still struggling with something. Well, you can get answers through soul writing, which will... Um, will answer those questions for you. So you can either, I do it with my regression work. Some people, uh, when we're done with the regression, I'll say to them, you know, do you wanna have the soul writing? Because the soul writing 
we'll get to we'll get to an even deeper level. It'll give them the backstory of what they just saw. It'll answer any questions that didn't get answered, and it may give them some guidance on well we'll say what am i supposed to do with this information joanne well okay let's ask spirit and so um so you get some information that way so there's all kinds of ways of applying it to your life it's 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 just got this incredible long list of applications for whether you're mainstream or whether you're deeply involved in esoteric studies and it doesn't matter what age you are either i think this is this is a good thing for children to learn but i haven't mm. really um i haven't explored that i'm gonna wait till my grandchildren are a little bit older because they're, they're too young yet to to know how to write so uh but i think it's something that um and everybody can do it and the more left brain you are you know a very analytical kind of person um the more profound and, and surprised that you that the I've had lawyers in my in the audience when I was doing live programs and they were getting and they were like stunned stunned at the level of the depth of the information that was coming through it's a very emotional experience you know I've had people cry but many people most people get an aha moment from it uh especially if you yes, let it so for an for an example so um so I'm just trying to think of what I might want to write about. Okay, perfect. I'm going to come up with an, an example. I'm just going to throw something out there. So let's say it's going to be Thanksgiving. We're in the middle of a pandemic. I have been invited to someone's home. And, you know, science tells me, do not be around other people. This is extremely dangerous. And in fact, the cases of COVID are coming up. That would present one thing. Another thing may be this longing. I don't want to be separate anymore. I really want to engage with people. So let's say I'm going to sit down and do some soul writing. Would D, would I use D for Debbie and S for spirit or soul? Or how, how would that start? Um, I usually get a greeting from when I start writing. It's my dear child, we are with you in love and in light. Hmm. And then, then, the, then the writing starts. And I told people that are new at it to just start to do... Um, move your let your wrist be loose and make ovals or l's or e's because out of that a word will come or a phrase will come mm -hmm. uh and to just um allow the message to appear it's like an oreo cookie debbie the <laughs> the beginning part of it is it's like hello we're glad you're here you know it's generic they get to the meat of the matter right in the middle of the, of the message and then it flows back out again so it isn't like you're putting debbie this is my question, spirit, this is the right. You could do that, but more, it's really an unbroken stream of consciousness writing. Mm. So it'll come to you. For some people, I'll just get words. Some people will get phrases. Other people will get whole sentences, but it's, it's, it gets to the heart of the matter. It gets to the really, um, the more profound the question you ask, the more profound the answer you'll receive. So, um, it's it's a it's a very valuable tool. I I use it for past life work as well. You can you can actually uh, if you don't want to do regression, you can do it through soul writing. Because I got an entire diary of my, one of my past life aspects. Uh, you know, you, your your conscious body sort of goes to sleep. Your subconscious comes forward. And um, I was doing the writing once and all of a sudden I was getting dates, 1792, 1804. And I'm like, what is this? And then the content was sounded like a historic romance novel. And I thought, I don't, I don't write like this. What is this? Well, that's what it turned out to be. It was my previous self writing her life story. Um, and then uh, Frank DeMarco, who's also a, a very prolific writer, um, wrote a book called Chasing Smallwood. And he did that as well, where his past life aspect of uh, uh, Joseph Smallwood, who lived, uh, was a Civil War uh, soldier, Confederate soldier, um, wrote all about his life. And, and from a historic point of view, it's fascinating to do that because they're they, that aspect of you that lived in another time period is telling you exactly what was going on in that time. So to talk about revisionist history, you know, <laughs> you learn a lot. Uh, you can learn a lot from yourself and it's all, it's all in there. It's all stored in the, in, inside, in your soul. You can access that information anytime you want. 
What about a future self? Have you ever been regressing somebody when in fact, a future aspect of themselves came through and started relating, this is who you're gonna be at some point in a continuum? That doesn't happen very often. I've, it's happened, I think, twice, but that's when people have asked me to do a progression rather than a regression. And you have to remember, we have free will. So whatever you're gonna see of yourself in the future at any point in time can change depending on choices that you're making in this life. So I tend not to go there. Um, you know, I, I really want people to understand the, the past life that's impacting them now. You know, so when I do a regression, that's what I ask their soul to do is to go to the past life that's most impacted them now because you're only working on, you know, three or four issues. And the lifetime that you're working on could have happened a thousand years ago. And you've only decided now that you're going to work on. And, and that's throughout my book. Uh, if you'll recall, a lot of people were remembering lifetimes that happened thousands of years ago. Egypt, Rome, Atlantis even, there was one. Uh, and their soul decided, even though they've had many lifetimes in between, their soul decided, you know, it's going to be in this 20th century, 21st century life that we're going to work on your issue of abandonment or your issue of responsibility or your, you know, um, your issue of acceptance and approval. So um, it's really fascinating uh, because when you, when you go back and you see the root cause of what you're dealing with now, it makes perfect sense. Unlike anything else. It's like you get these aha moments all the time, like, oh, no wonder. Uh, and then you can deal with it. And once you deal with it, resolve it, forgive. We do a lot of forgiveness work uh, and put it behind you. Then you're free to, to move on. You know, I'm such a believer. I love this idea of a soul contract, you know, and the way you describe it in the book. I don't know, I guess I have a picture in my mind of what it looks like. But you know, it's basically you and a bunch of other souls in your group standing around and everybody's like, they're all actors, I'm going to play this. Okay, I'm going to play that. Yeah. Would you do this for me? I'm going to go experience X, Y, Z. And everybody's, you know, huzzah, yeah, <laughs> we'll come yeah. to an agreement and into the next life they go. And so, you know, mad believer. And I actually love this concept because I think when, if somebody has not had a good childhood or experienced trauma, or there's so many things you could fill in the blank when you suddenly realize, no, I actually made an agreement to do this for great purpose, it sort of takes the onus and the victimhood off of it. So I like that very much. I have many friends who have done this work, who have come back and reported just incredible uh, experiences during regression. So my mm -hmm. question is really, like I have an oddity about me and I'm wondering if you experienced this with anyone else and if you might speak to it a little. So for someone like me, I'm an open-minded skeptic and I'm extremely spiritual and metaphysical. I always have been since I was little. And yet, if anybody tried to regress me, this panic has always risen up in me. And I remember the first time someone was trying to do it in hypnosis and said, look down at your feet, what do you see? And this panic uh, came up of having to produce something and I was so torn between my fear of imagining uh, mm -hmm. and not being able to do it. And, and I can't tell you how free I am in every other aspect. Yeah. Right? Right. So, and it's continued. It's actually become a thing for me. Um, I think one person had success uh, with a lot of shamanistic lifetimes that I've had. And that felt really right, like very profound. Um, and he used a timeline method. But in general, somebody who might be extremely open-minded about something like this, could there be, and I didn't think about this till I read your book and I suddenly went, oh, I wonder if this is part of like my very quirky soul design that all this stuff is like, yep. But when it comes to the past life regression, there's something that's like the soul went, not, not this time. Yeah, something, uh, there may be an obstacle in there and it may be that your soul, you're not ready to see that. Or it may be that 
you might be wanting to be going to a lifetime that's not very pleasant. And so you don't want to put yourself through that. Because if, if you say, take me to the lifetime that's most impacting me now, and that was a very difficult, painful lifetime, you're not going to want to revisit that. So you automatically throw up roadblocks, you know, like shut it down, shut it down. Um, I had a, a client the other day who um, she would not get into the body. Of, she would not get into her past life body. She had there. So, she was like next to him, and she would have to ask him, like if I said to her, "Look down at your feet. Uh, these are the feet that you had. Are they bare? Or are they covered?" You know, she couldn't answer it on her own. She had to turn to him to ask him if it was okay. And he only gave her so much information she could share with me. But even so, we were able to get enough that she saw the parallel between her current life and the past life. That's the goal. We want to tie the two together. We want you to understand that the things that you're dealing with now have their origin in a life that may have happened many, 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 many years ago. Okay, and you're just decided as a soul, you're gonna, you're so brave when you're in spirit, when you're in the afterlife, you go, I'm, I'm gonna work on that in the next, my next lifetime. Then you get here and you go, oh, That's no, hilarious. I don't wanna work on that. <laughs> you know? What was I thinking? What was I thinking? That's why I also too, like I ask people, what are your final thoughts as your soul leaves your body? Because many times that reveals um, the issue and what you're gonna be working on in the next lifetime. So uh, I had a woman uh, who had head to toe psoriasis because I do a lot with physical karma as well. I have another book that just deals with physical karma uh, called Karma Can Be a Real Pain. But she came <laughs> to me with head to toe psoriasis and she uh, wanted to know its source. So we went back to a lifetime in the old west where she was a call girl. And when I asked her, uh, at her at, upon her death, what were her last thoughts? She said, I don't want to be touched anymore. So she manifests a skin condition in this life in which nobody wants to touch her. So that's why that was a really important element of my research project as well, asking people, what were your last thoughts? Because like I said, many times that is what they're working on. If they said, I should have loved more, I should have been kinder, you know, I didn't take advantage of opportunities. Uh, there's all kinds of, or I didn't do enough for my family. In this lifetime, you could see that they're doing, they're loving more, they're being kinder, they're so just to balance that out. So it's really quite fascinating um, when when we work together to see those parallels, and um, and as far as making it up, that's like my number one question when when I get a, when somebody comes to me, I'm afraid I'm going to make it up. So you know what I say to them? Look, if you if you think you're going to make it up. This implies that you've given this a lot of thought, you've created a crazy story, and you're going to not only spend three hours with me and tell me this story, but you're going to pay me to listen to you. And so not very many people uh, do that. And I do ask them at the end, I said, would you have made up that story? And they all say, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. So I think you could be fairly um, confident that this is not uh, your, a figment of your imagination. But then we'd have to go into, well, where does imagination even come from? So, um, you know, so there's all kinds of elements of it. But no, I, uh, nobody that I've ever regressed has said afterwards that they would have made up that particular lifetime, especially if it was emotional. Because I've had people, they'll cry, they'll laugh. Uh, and I can't make you do that in hypnosis. That's something that... Uh, uh, I can't force that. That's a natural thing. That just shows it's a real memory. Mm. So, um, yeah, so it's fascinating. It is fascinating. When you're, when you were starting out in this, you're, you're getting your degrees, you're getting your certification, you're working with some of these pretty high end mentors. Did you have any idea that you would end up here being a multi, multi hyphenated author with a lot of books out there speaking on stage, becoming an expert, doing these research projects, did you have any sense that this was your calling? No, as a matter of fact, I um, resisted it for the longest time because uh, I'm a writer by profession. And, um, and when I think of what my mission in life is, which is one of the questions I ask when I do these Life Between Life sessions, what's your soul's purpose? We get to that. My soul's purpose is to be a reporter for the universe. 
That's how I see myself, which means that I love to do research. I love to, to listen to everybody, read books on different subjects, put it all together, sandwich it together, and then give it to you. Mm. And uh, so I thought, you know, I want to, I know that there's something sacred going on between the client and the therapist when they're doing this work. But unless you're in the room with them, you're never gonna know what that is. So my goal was to tell people what that was. So I had a very dear friend, Henry Leo Bolduck, who is a, a very prolific writer and speaker with the uh, Edgar Casey's ARE. He's since passed, um, Henry has. And, um, and so I, I confided in him about my own past lives and you know, I had started a past life or research organization when I lived outside of Chicago. So I would bring him in and he would do talks for us. And um, he said, Joanne, you know, 98% more than what a typical past life therapist knows. Why aren't you doing this work? I said, no, 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 I'm a writer, I'm an observer. And he goes, no, 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 you should be doing this work. So he badgered me for years. And finally I gave in and I, um, I got my, my uh, certification and then I went out and got my master's degree and all of that. But, um, you know, for me, it was all about credibility. I really wanted, um, this wasn't a hobby for me. This was a sacred, very sacred work. And so I didn't want to be the kind that took a weekend course, put a shingle out, and then I got clients that way. So I took it very seriously. And um, through my work with the ARE, you know, I started to do talks. Uh, which I, which was difficult for me in the in the beginning because um, my throat would close up the moment I would get up to talk. It was uh, and I found out it was because I had a lot of throat um, chakra karma from previous lives where I either had my throat slit or my tongue ripped out or I was hung or something because I was speaking my truth at that time about guess what subject this this whole subject. So naturally that memory would kick in when I would get in front of a group of people. If I didn't have a script in front of me, I was lost. So I had to work through that. Uh, and do, then I had to work through my uh, getting these books published, uh, doing the research behind the book first. So developing a research project, which I love to do, and then putting it together. Um, and I think that by doing that, um, I hope that, uh, because there's all this research behind the things that I'm writing about. It's not just Joanne pontificating about something. Uh, then it lends a little bit more credibility to the projects and people can feel a little bit more confident about it uh, if they choose to do it themselves. And I think it's interesting your connection to Edgar Cayce and ARE. You know, when I first started in metaphysics, um, I read so many of his books and I, but, you know, it's not something you hear about a lot anymore, I think, is this area, arena of metaphysics has become more and more populated. Do you, why do you think you were drawn to Casey's work or compelled? Do you think it has to do with a past life? Yeah, definitely. I know that, that I had been in multiple past lives with him. And because we travel together as a pod, we travel together as a soul family. And you can either be on the periphery, the periphery of it, or you can be right in the center of it. Um, but when I first started out, I was like a little sponge. You know, I, this was like 1987. Uh, and Shirley MacLaine's uh, book, Out on a Limb, became a miniseries in January of that year. They aired it on ABC. To me, that was my, my big wake-up call. I think there were a lot of sleeping metaphysicians at the time that woke up after, after Shirley went out on a limb and, and uh, invited us to join her. And we did. And, and then I thought, well, where do I go now? Where do I go to get this information? And I knew about the ARE. I didn't know anything about Edgar Casey so much. And, uh, and I found such a comfort in being there and, and um, their library is to die for. I mean, it is just this, I think it's the second largest next to the Vatican uh, of metaphysical books. Um, and it was spectacular and the classes, the, the conferences that they held and the newsletters and the magazines and all that. And I thought, hey, these are my people. Matter of fact, my kids used to say when I would go to an ARE conference, 
oh, mom's going to be with her people, you know, <laughs> because it was true. You could be with them and you don't have to edit what you say. So the Casey, Casey did 14,000 readings in his life. 12,000 of those were health readings. They were not past life readings. They were health readings. And his remedies are still way ahead of, of, med of traditional medicine, I, I believe. But the 2,000 that were life readings, he would give people their past lives and he would tell them um, who they had been in a previous life and what, why they were dealing with what happened then and then what's going on now. And uh, actually one of the readings he gave for a little two day old baby boy um, who ended up living in the Casey household for nine years. He said this little boy was the reincarnation of Thomas Jefferson and Alexander the Great. Now imagine being two days old and being having that put on you, right? That's like the and, Dalai Lama, right? Somebody yeah, coming right. to this little child's yeah. house and saying, you're the one, come with yeah, us. Yeah, Life and changing. Casey said to him, you, you, this soul can do for the world what Jefferson did for this country. My book is all about why that didn't happen. And, oh, that's your next book. Yeah, the Edgar Casey book. and the Unfulfilled Destiny of Thomas Jefferson, Jefferson Reborn. Yeah, that's it. So, so I was able to go into the archives. They've got extensive archives at the ARE in Virginia Beach, Virginia. That's where they're headquartered. Um, and I was in heaven. I was just in absolute heaven to be doing all that research. And, uh, but, um, you know, working with the ARE and then at the time listening, going to listen to people that were on the cutting edge of this work because I had the past life research organization, I contacted the leading authors and practitioners in the field and, or else they came in through the ARE because we had a big ARE file in Chicago and I was on that core team as well. And so I got to meet a lot of um, uh, extraordinary people um, and I invited them to speak to uh, at, our, at my organization and we became friends. So they became my my peer group after a while. And I learned a lot from them. And so it's just been a wonderful journey. Um, and uh, the years that I spent at Atlantic University getting my master's in transfer, well, they call it transpersonal psychology now. Those were, those were fabulous years. And I hear so many people say, you know, Edgar Casey saved my life. Because it seems so many people have stories where they're really so depressed and so, um, they have no hope for the future. And then suddenly a Casey book will literally fall at their feet and they'll pick it up and read it. And, and after that, the whole trajectory of their life changes. So, so he is my, my spiritual mentor. And, um, and I, I would have given anything to have had a reading from him, but the, unfortunately he died before I was even born. Me but too. His, I'm with you, Joanne. Work, what I would love you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because the depth, you know, when you read the books of what happens when he goes into one of his trances and the level of detailed information he offers, it's astounding. Like yeah. that would, yeah, a gift. Um, are you, by the way, any relation at all to baseball player Joe DiMaggio? No, unfortunately. I know. You know, I used to tell people when they would ask me that, I'd say, Yes, and you should have seen my Aunt Marilyn. You know? <laughs> but no, no, I'm, I'm not. Joe and Joanne DiMaggio. Okay. And um, so, so contracts. And some of your work also includes something called the Council of Elders. Yes. So how does the Council of Elders help assist us in mapping out our next life? Well, if you think of Earth as a school, so we're all here in school, we're taking classes. So whatever you signed up for, that's your class, that's your curriculum, right? And you're here taking that class and hopefully you're gonna pass that class. The Council of Elders are made up of wise beings. They're ascended masters. They're, they're actually are the authority in the spirit world. You can think of them, if you're gonna use the analogy of Earth as a school, think of them as your guidance counselors. So when you are in your in between life uh, time, um, 
you work with the council, you'll go before this council of elders. And it isn't a judgmental council. They're not there to go, well, you really screwed up in that last lifetime. They're not, they, they are a very loving, non-judgmental, compassionate group of people. Their whole goal is, you know, they keep their eye on, on, the, on the bigger picture. And that is you completing your soul's journey so that, you know, you don't need to come back anymore. So they, um, they're they there to counsel you uh, and uh, they will help you look at your, the karmic issues that you had in this past life that you're working on now. We make a list of those issues. They'll also help you define the karmic attributes, the, char the good the characteristics, the things that you've worked through already and you don't need to work through them again because you've already accomplished that. And uh, what your soul's purpose is. So um, they, I ask uh, everybody in my group, um, what do they look like? Uh, and most of them appear to be male or female typical, but I had a lot who said that they were biblical characters. They were seeing Jesus, Mary Magdalene, Moses. They were seeing um, uh, Mary, mother of God. They were seeing, um, uh, Archangel Michael, Archangel Raphael. Uh, and this is different from the work that Dr. Michael Newton did. Now, he's the expert in the field of life between lives. He's written many books on the subject. And in his research, none of his, none of his clients saw biblical characters. So I don't really know why in my group that was plenty. But they also saw kind of, they, they had um, animal totems, there they had so some people one person had a whale uh which i thought was some people had trees and um it, it was kind of all over the board uh and some of them were whimsical like somebody said oh i have one that looks like tinkerbell or one that looks like that boy that's got his thumb in the in the dike you know holding back the the water so um but they would spend time with them and uh go through their lifetime and then pick out and then they would also work with them to define what their soul's mission is going to be. So that's where the contract is written uh, with, with the Council of Elders help and their assistance. And then you go on to see your soul family decide you're gonna pick your mother and father, um, which people find really uh, astounding because they're like, I pick them for my parents. You've got to be kidding me. But yes, you, you do pick your parents. And then members of your soul family. So this group of souls that's with you lifetime after lifetime after lifetime, they're going to come forward and go, you know, Debbie, when you become Debbie, <laughs> I'm going to be, I'm going to be your uncle, or I'm going to be your cousin, or I'm going to be your best friend or something. And I'm going to come in and this is what I'm going to do. This is the role that I'm going to play in your life so that I can help you uh, and sometimes, you know, it isn't very pleasant because sometimes they challenge you uh, and they're hurt, it feels hurtful. Uh, other times they're just very supportive and loving. So um, if you remember that these souls came into your life out of love for your soul to help your soul grow, then forgiveness, if they do something to you that's hurtful, is a lot easier because um, I've had to work through that as, as well. So it's, it's an interesting process, uh, you know, but it's all encompassing and it answers almost every question you could possibly have. So, it's, you know, if, if we were to look around at our life, all the people from our childhood till right now, how do we know, oh, you're part of my soul family. You're probably not part of my soul family. What is that recognition that takes place? How would we determine that? Well, you can, if you zero in on the essence of their soul, first of all, their eyes, the eyes are the windows to the soul. You've heard that before. I think that's a Shakespeare um, statement. Um, you could feel a person out. They'll, they'll feel like, if you know your that past life, you'll know, oh, you feel like my grandmother from that other lifetime. You have to remember too, that we change sexes. So right. you could be female in this life, but you could have been male in the previous life or vice versa. So you could have your father in this life could have been your sister in a previous life. But there's something about them that if you zero in on it, just the essence of who they are, they have a familiarity about them. Um, you know, I think people go through their whole life without ever thinking about any of this. 
you know? Um, and so, but I've always thought to me, this is normal <laughs> to thinking about, you know, do I know you? You, you, I sense that I know you, or I don't know you. I don't think you necessarily have to know. Um, yeah. Cause you've had, you've got hundreds of souls, you know, that in your soul family, they don't all come in with you at the same time. Mm. That's why in this process that we do together, uh, um, I ask them who's stepping forward and saying, I'm going to volunteer and come in with you. And this is why I'm going to come in with you. So if your issue is abandonment, then they're going to come in and at some point in life, they're going to abandon you. <laughs> really? I mean, it, it sounds bizarre. I mean, it's just funny that you would say that of all the issues, because that has been the core wound I had to deal with. I mean, I like to think, dear God, that after all the work I've done, I feel quite over it. Mm -hmm. But there is no doubt based on my childhood and, you know, much of like, oh, you didn't get it the first time. (laughs) Now this is going to show up to make sure you got it. So it's funny you would bring up abandonment because there is no doubt uh, that I had some pretty brave souls. And and I was brave, too, to say I'm going to take that on. Yeah. Not pleasant. Yeah. No, no. But, you know, some lifetimes are pleasant, though. Some lifetimes, you know, if you go into a past life thinking, oh, I'm going to have this terrible trauma I'm going to have to deal with. You don't necessarily. Karma is not bad. Right. Karma is and just I also want to say, like, just because, you know, my childhood was predicated. There was a lot of neglect and abandonment. But I still feel like I have an amazing life. Like, I'm so grateful I got through. I'm so grateful the contrary choices I've made about who I've become. Yeah. And I, you know, I love my life and I love who's in my life and I love the potency that I feel like I am. And even the fact sort of concurrently with the abandonment, fascinating enough as a little creature, I was always fascinated by the things you're talking about. So even as a little girl, we get like tarot books and astrology books. I kind of feel like it saved me you know, yeah. to have a higher yeah. understanding of things. Yeah, and our, our childhood has, there are a lot of clues to past lives in our childhood. Hmm. Uh, and if you start to look at different aspects of your childhood, you could put together a fairly comprehensive puzzle. You know, what costume did you always want to wear at Halloween? What books did you go and pick out at the library? Um, what games did you like to play? Um, you know, did your parents take you on trips and did, did certain locations speak to you? I always loved the 18th century for me. And that's where these memory triggers come in, by the way, which I mentioned at the end of the book. So the memory triggers are, you get those before you come in and they're like deja vu experiences. So they're implanted in you. So when something comes up, when, when you have one of those feelings, it's, it's, intended to remind you of that past life or of the people in that life with you. So when I was a child, I loved anything to do with 18th century American history. And I would wear my hair in ringlets and I would write with a a feather pen and I would listen to Baroque music. I was a very, very strange child because I grew up in a, in a South side of Chicago, blue collar neighborhood. People did not do those sort of things. So I was just kind of on my own with that. Um, Dolly Madison, Abigail Adams, those are my heroes. Um, and then when I got into college, I majored in what else history. And uh, I had a professor call me in once and he said, you have the most uncanny feel for the 18th century of any student I've ever had. And I thought, you know, I do, but I didn't know why at the time. Well, it made a lot of sense later on, you know, when I found out that I in fact had this 18th century life. So a lot of the essays that I was writing were based more on memory than they were on listening to his lectures. So uh, I still love history. And I think that being a a past life researcher and therapist has kept me connected to that aspect of myself that loves history. And I think other people, you could find that uh, in anyone's life. Yeah, for sure. I know what you're saying. I felt that before I took a trip to Italy, I was actually obsessed with the just the idea of Italy. And uh, when I went, it did not disappoint. And in <laughs> fact, not only that, but after almost three weeks there, and what an extraordinary trip that was for my soul. 
I still, to this day, I could have a house there and be very, very happy. There was this incredible resonance with that country and those people. And I love the language. And when I brought it up, you know, it's funny, you talked about COVID and some of the things we're doing. I've been doing so much in my life before COVID that there wasn't very much to add. I will say one of the things that's come up for me that's awesome. I used to be a professional actress and singer. When I got into radio 13 years ago, I released the singing. I had to tell the band I was with and, you know, the jazz band and the big band, you know, I have to make priorities. And, and it's not that I don't love singing, but for today, it's, this is the path. It's books and radio. And it, it popped for me in the last three months, like, oh, my voice, you know, Hmm. So I started singing and I begun doing that again. And it's been amazing. And I will say like uh, with Italy and things like that, I've said to people, if there's one language I would learn, it's Italian. And people like, you live in California. Like, (laughs) why would you do that? Why would you not learn Spanish? Spanish makes more sense. It's true. It's a thousand percent more logical and much (laughs) easier to travel the world. But man... I would oh, I love know. to speak Italian. I have I to know. say probably again. <laughs> yeah. I grew up in a, uh, I'm a hundred percent Sicilian. Ah. So I grew up in, um, my parents were born in this country, but when they didn't want my brother and I to understand what they were saying, they would talk to Ital- in Italian to each other, but they would not allow us to learn, which I really regret. But that's how I stumbled onto the soul writing because <laughs> one uh, day I got really disgusted. I thought, gee, this isn't right that you're talking Italian and not sharing that with us. So I remember going into the bathroom and sitting under the sink with a pen and a paper. And I asked, I prayed, you know, good, good Catholic girl that I was, I said, Jesus, can you please give me a code that I can have that I can write things and leave them around the house and mom won't know what they are because she won't be able to read them. And then maybe she'll know what it feels like, you know. <laughs> so uh, I got a code. I, I, you know, I had this code down. And uh, so I did that and my mother didn't care. So I forgot about it. But then 20 something years later, I'm in a calligraphy class and the teacher is talking about the history of calligraphy of handwriting, not calligraphy, of handwriting. And she pulls down a chart and there is my code. And I looked at it and I thought, what is that? And it was the Phoenician alphabet. So somehow as a child, you know, when I talk about soul writing, it's like, ask anything, anything you want, you're gonna get it, right? So this little child is asking Jesus, send me this code, hello, I'm I'm ready. And these letters for, the Phoenician alphabet. And uh, so there, uh, it, it sort of tied it into the whole idea of getting past life information through the soul writing as well. So um, yeah, that's what that's how I started uh, to do it. I didn't realize I was doing it. I just stumbled on it like that. So yeah, I would love to go to, I've never been to Italy. I would love, uh, it's on my bucket list. Uh, but places that you resonate to are a sign of, of a past life. I grew up in Chicago, uh, south side of Chicago, and um, I never felt like that was home. I kept thinking, who are you people and why am I here? And I kept thinking, you know, I had a garden. I remember flowers and here I am, on, you know, in, in this uh, little south side neighborhood and um, uh, I hated it there. I absolutely did. I just, but I didn't know where I belonged until I graduated from college and I decided to go to all those places that my teach that my professor said I had this uncanny feel for. So I started in uh, Virginia and worked my way up to Boston. When I got to Virginia, it was all over. I mean, this is, I, my soul felt this sigh of relief, like I'm home. And uh, it took me 25 years to get here permanently, but, but here I am now. So, so yeah, pay, that's one of the things I tell people, pay attention to the places that you long to go to that, that or when you're there, you have these deja vu feelings like, you know, some of the historic homes that I visited in here in Virginia, I already knew where everything was or what. So, you know, it, uh, there's a sense of home, there's a sense of belonging when, and, you know, when you can tie it together like that. So that is one of the many clues. Um, I also teach a, a resonance method of past life recall. That's for people who don't 
uh, who are a little concerned about using hypnosis. And with that, you can um, just make a list of all the things in your life that you resonate to, the, the cultures, the languages, the foods, religions, um, there's a long list, but, um, but there's so many ways of accessing past life information. Um, I think the one-on-one -on -one, you know, regression is the best because you've got somebody guiding you and uh, helping you along, uh, but there's other ways besides that. Yeah, oh, that's, thank you for sharing that story. That's so incredible. And, and I know what you're saying. Um, you know, I look at my boyfriend as a total white boy, and yet he's got this <laughs> profound fascination with Middle Eastern music. And, you know, he loves Persian music and Armenian music and eats the food all the time. And he makes like, he's makes exquisite hummus and other things. And then here I am, I was raised Jewish, although I don't claim that, I really just claim spirituality today, but I'm in Italy and I'm walking around and I see these churches, so many hundreds of years old. And I walk in them thinking, I'm just gonna walk in and take a look and something profound happened to me. And I was on my knees praying yeah. and going, who is this? What's yeah. Like, and I, I stayed there easily just by myself. No one else was there in these ancient, ancient churches for hours. It was it, like, I needed this. And yeah. I stayed um, once in this city called Assisi, which is beautiful, beautiful. At the very top, right before the mountains begin in Assisi, I had such an awesome hotel room. And I remember sitting on the bed and looking up and there was a picture in the room of St. Francis of Assisi and again, I'm like, I know this person, I know this experience, I know, I know this town, I know this, like, yeah. and I was sitting there going, what is going on with me? Yeah. Because I hadn't felt any of these things before, but there yeah. is, I'm quite sure it's been many, 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 many Italian lifetimes. Yeah. And I uh, feel like even the face, right? <laughs> La face. Like, what is this? <laughs> um, it's so funny in this life that I would have I think a very Italian looking face and um, nobody in my family, certainly. Uh, if anything, it's like Russian, Polish, Austrian, you know, sort of everywhere else. Um, yeah. So this stuff is very fascinating. I like how you put that, that, you know, look at your proclivities, look at what you're drawn to and, and compelled and fascinated by. And so yeah. that leads me, Joanne, to ask you about the body. Cause that's kind of like, hmm. So, you know, the the of your body, the size of your body, the shape, like why, why, why was that so important that we decided that? Well, again, it wasn't random. Uh, you, you choose the body that you're gonna need to help you complete your mission. Um, hmm. We all have layers of male and female. So remember I had said that you're not always female in the lifetime you have had male lifetimes and vice versa, but 75% uh, of the time you are the same sex. So if you um, lean toward being feminine, being female, then you'll find most of your lifetimes were like that, which is interesting because when I do a regression on somebody, the women do not have any problem if a male lifetime comes up. They are fine with it. The men fight. I don't want to be a woman. I don't want to be in this body. And I know why, because they're not used to feeling so, they feel powerless. Mm -hmm. You know, they feel weaker, um, physically weaker now, you know. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so Edgar Casey said that gender is based on what you want to accomplish. So a lot of the uh, uh, people in my study who are female in this life, they said they wanted to become female because they wanted to feel, they wanted to give birth. They wanted to have that, that, uh, that experience of, of childbirth. Um, they wanted to be more nurturing. Um, the, you select a body for its challenges too. So you could pick a body that, uh, or you pick the race that you want to be, you know, that you're going to come in as. Um, the reason I mentioned earlier about picking your parents is because when you select those two souls as your parents, you know ahead of time what is going to be the um, socioeconomic uh, environment that you're going to be born into. Okay, so you know already like, oh, if I pick those two people, I'm going to be 
in India or I'm going to be in Italy <laughs> or whatever, you know. Um, so, um, you know, uh, a lot of the people in my study picked a body that was like the body they had in, in their past life because they really liked it and they wanted to, to, to do that again. Others, women who were exceptionally beautiful in a previous life often would pick a plainer body in this life because they perceived that that beauty had gotten them into trouble somehow mm -hmm. or that it had, had blocked them or they weren't taken seriously or whatever. It depends on the time period that we're talking about. Um, so, and they're almost never genetically uh, lined up with our biological family from, in other words, we don't reincarnate in our biological family. Now there are some cultures that'll say that, you know, oh, I recognize that child recognizes his grandfather or, you know, and, and or that woman was my wife. They'll say that as a, Dr. Ian Stevenson, who worked here in, in Charlottesville at the University of Virginia, had done a lot of studies with children and, and that's what he found. Um, most, all of um, Edgar Casey and I know that Dr. Newton and others have said that we don't, we don't necessarily um, reincarnate in our same biological family. So the next lifetime you're going to have, it won't be, a, you, won't, you may not be a direct descendant of who you are now. The people in your family may be with you again in different roles, but they may not be genetically related to you. So I, you know, all this, um, people are fascinated with getting these DNA tests now, right? Yes, yes. They want to do their gene genealogical studies, but I say you've got to do a lot more than swab your cheek to find your soul's <laughs> identity, believe me. Yeah. I fully agree with you, boy. Uh, especially when you take into account, you know, other universes and things, you know, that to me is also a big fascination with other lives. So yeah, that's a, that's way deeper than a swab. Oh, and yeah. so well, tell me, first of all, how can people find you? How can they work with you or how can they find out more about you? Um, please visit my website. It's, it was just revamped and I'm really proud of it. It's, uh, joannedimaggio.com. That's J-O-A-N-N-E-D-I-M-A-G-G-I-O.com. It lists all of the different types of regressions that I do, because I'll do the traditional past life regression, but you can also do one with soul writing. I've got one that's specific for physical karma. So if you've got a chronic condition and you don't know the source of it, you've maybe exhausted traditional medicine, you can you can have a, a, a physical karma uh, session and then the life between lives session. And if you also wanna learn how to do the soul writing, you could book that as well. So all the details on what's covered in each session, I do them all on Zoom. Uh, so you can, you could book it right on my website. There's a calendar there. Uh, and then all of my books are on, uh, they're listed in the, uh, on the website, but they're also uh, through, through Amazon. Beautiful. And this is Dare to Dream, Joanne. What do you next dare to dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Oh gosh, I think I would like to open people's hearts and minds to the understanding that we're all one and that the soul doesn't die, it just continues. Um, and to make it more of a household understanding the percentage of people who believe in reincarnation in the West is very low compared to the Eastern part of the world. So, um, but mostly I just really want to be in service to people to help them understand better their soul's journey and just kind of assist them on the way. Uh, and so, uh, and so I plug away at it every day and hope that and I know that it's made a difference in a lot of people's lives. So I just want to continue to do that. And praying that God gives me the time to do the creation universe gives me the time to, to get all those goals accomplished. Well, I look forward to your next book. And I have to say this whole Phoenician thing is still in my brain. I mean, <laughs> like pretty amazing um, yeah. what poured through you with zero blocks or obstacles as a child. Very, oh. very, very fascinating. So. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming on and creating more, way more illumination around the subject.
Again, her book, if you want to go to YouTube to watch us do this interview, youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. Thank you always for subscribing and for leaving your comments. I do read all of them and I write back to most of you, by the way. So thank you. I, I love reading reading what you have to say and how the shows impact you. And I end today's show with this quote from Dr. Bruce Goldberg. My hope is that you keep your mind open. It is not hypnotherapists who heal. It is you who have the ultimate responsibility, past life regression and progression into future lives allow you to expand and explore your awareness and eliminate fear, anxiety, depression, and other negative tendencies, as well as the fear of death. Hypnotherapy is neither magic nor a panacea. It is a way to help shape the future by creating your own reality with the knowledge from your subconscious and superconscious minds. You can positively affect your present and future lives. Subscribe to the Dare to Dream podcast to hear this number one weekly transformation conversation. My guest next week is Dr. Gabriel Cousins. He's a best selling author, holistic physician, homeopath, psychiatrist, family therapist, Ayurvedic practitioner, and a Chinese herbalist. He is considered to be one of the leading live food vegan medical doctors, holistic physicians, and the world expert on spiritual nutrition. And he also is going to be discussing a cure for diabetes. You'll absolutely want to tune in. And I thank you as always for daring to dream and daring to create all your dreams into your reality. <laughs>